Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Up in far north Queensland, farther than most of us will ever travel, where locals live closer to Papua New Guinea than any Australian capital city, there's a group of people who have embedded themselves into the country in a way that few can endure. South of the tiny town of Pomperor on the Cape York Peninsula, where the rich red dirt gives way to humid, swampy mangroves, where crocodiles lay sunning themselves on the banks of the Coleman River, and flies aren't just a nuisance, but a constant onslaught. Two fishing families live side by side. Their homes consist of whatever they've been able to drag into this remote location. A caravan, a few bits of tin pulled together in a rough shed structure. Anything that no longer serves a purpose is left where it lay. Old tyres, fishing gear and personal belongings littering the ground around the campsite. This is how the wards and the gators have lived for generations, spending more time on the water than on land, making a living from whatever they can pull from the sea, barramundi a favourite. But along with their rough lifestyle comes a rough life, conflict and turf wars over prime fishing territory. Everyone has a gun. When Bevan Simmons married one of the ward daughters, he didn't realise it would literally be the death of him. It was a calm, sunny morning when Bevan Simmons and his 10-year-old son Brad went to check their shark nets but the daily routine ended in June 2003. Missing, presumed murdered, their bodies have never been found. Bevan, along with he and Kathy Ward's 10-year-old son Brad, would head out one morning to clear the shark nets they'd set up about five kilometres from the mouth of the Coleman River. But they would never come home. What happened to Bevan and Brad after they set off in their dinghy that day is shrouded in family secrecy. Brad Simmons and his father Bevan haven't been seen in more than two years and prosecutors say it's all because of the affair Cathy Simmons was having with a jealous trawler skipper. It's alleged with the help of his mother Joan, he murdered father and son and disposed of their bodies. He then spent the night with an oblivious Cathy aboard the family boat, the El Dorado. Kathy denied having an affair with the son of a rival fishing family. But for everyone in that community, it was no secret. The Gulf has tried to put a blanket over the whole thing. They just want it all suppressed. No one talks about it anymore. As for the young boy, I mean... I think he was just bloody um, in the wrong spot at the wrong time, you know. Unbelievable. Ten-year-old bloody kid out with his dad fishing. So was this a crime of passion? Or was it a carefully orchestrated move by one of the family matriarchs to keep her son in the family business, a young boy accidentally caught up in the crossfire? Police say it was murder, but to this day... Not a single scrap of evidence has been found and the long, flat horizon of the Gulf of Carpentaria has never given up a clue as to what happened to Bevan Simmons and his little boy. I'm Claire Murphy and this is True Crime Conversations a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. When Bevan and Brad Simmons went missing off the coast of the Cape York Peninsula in 2003, a massive air, land and sea search was launched to find the pair. Bevan's wife and Brad's mother Kathy started the search along with a member of a rival fishing family, Michael Gator, when the boys didn't return from clearing nets. The operation covered a huge area, but in the days and weeks that followed, no evidence, not their boat, not a body, not even a piece of fishing gear that may have floated away if they'd capsized, was found. To this day, 
the final resting place of Bevan and Brad is unknown. But the story that emerged from the ongoing rivalry between the wards and the Gators would eventually lead to charges being laid. Emmy Award nominated filmmaker Justine A. Rosenthal delves into the Simmons family disappearance in her new documentary, The Cape, which is currently streaming on Stan. She joins us now. Justine, I have to start by saying full snaps to you and your camera crew for spending any time out in the wilderness on the Cape. I mean, it is beautiful to watch in your documentary because that scenery is amazing. But compared to the modern city or suburban lifestyle most of us are living, it is strikingly different. So remote, almost untouched tropical landscape where this very small population of people are living and they mostly get around by boat because the bushland is so dense. There's almost no roads. It couldn't have been easy to insert yourself into that world. Well, I have to say I did a lot of it from Los Angeles, just sent everyone out (laughs) into the wild. (laughs) <laughs> That's the privilege of fixing things on the other end of the shoot. Yeah, yeah. But yes, the scenery is amazing, but it is lawless and everyone there has guns. And without any law and order, you are, you know, out there on your own hoping for the best. This is how Dan Sweeney, a retired fisheries patrol officer who was working in the Cape region when Bevan and Brad went missing, described what it's like to live and work in the area. If you haven't got a criminal record, you don't live in the Gulf. That's what some of them used to say. They're fighting sharks, they're fighting crocodiles, they're fighting each other. If there wasn't three fights in the pub a night, the pub was closed. It's just a frontier. It's like the wild, wild west, really. Can you give us an idea of the area where Bevan Simmons lived and worked in the time leading up to his disappearance, what was that area of Cape York like? Well, look, it's about 250,000 square kilometres with a handful of people living in it. And it is crocodile infested waters, mangroves, swamps, very isolated. And I don't think any of that's changed even since the disappearance. It's not as if all of a sudden everyone's descended upon that part of the world. So you are out in the wild with very little protection except for whatever you can provide for yourself. So that's describing like a pretty vast area. There are some small towns spread out through there. What towns are we looking at in this area and what's the populations like and the people like who live and work in the towns around there? Well, you're talking about, I think, about 35,000 people in that area and towns like Karumba and Weepa that are scattered around there. And then you have an indigenous community. And I sort of always say, it's like there are concentric circles of belonging. So the indigenous community there really has a very different relationship to the land and to the nature than do even the fishing communities who are more at war with it and more brutal with it. And then you have our victims who were truly outsiders coming into this land. The father had grown up more in the cattle areas. And so I think never felt truly a part of that world, even though he lived within it. Can we talk about that world? What brought Bevan Simmons out into this territory because it is so very isolated and from what I can tell, those people who exist in the fishing community there that you mentioned, they live a very, very hard existence out there. What attracted Bevan Simmons to that life? Well, a girl. So he ends up meeting at school Kathy Ward, who becomes Kathy Simmons and she gets pregnant, and they initially do not live with her fishing dynasty. And then she says, you know, I want to go home. I want to fish. And that's what brings him into that world, and again, also what keeps him as an outsider in that world for the entire time. 
Can we talk about Kathy's family there for a moment? You mentioned the wards and their fishing dynasty. What does that mean in relation to these communities out in this remote, very, very far North Territory? Well, there were in essence sort of two fishing dynasties, two fishing clans, the wards and the gators. And the wards are, I would say, sort of slightly more the upstanding citizens of the community. The wards have an encampment. It's not luxurious, but they you know, have some caravans on the land and their boats. And the gators truly live only on their boats. And that's one of the differences between the two. And what's the relationship like between those two dynasties? Well, I think it's changed since Bevan and Brad's disappearance. Those two families were very close. The children played together growing up. The Gators have several children, and one of them is Michael Gator, who is about the same age as Kathy Ward on the other side. And again, I think if those two dynasties had united, all would have been you know, well and happy in that world and probably what was expected. And things didn't turn out quite that way. So Bevan comes out with Kathy to join the fishing community out there. And as you've already mentioned, he comes in as an outsider. Just how difficult was it for him to establish himself in that community, considering the lifelong bonds that those people already had who lived there? Look, I can't speak for him, but my sense is that it was very difficult. He certainly made friends with others. One in particular who's in the film, a gentleman named Rod Flood, who also considered himself an outsider and is sort of the moral compass of the film. Bevan and I made a connection because he was on the outer. I was a new kid on the block. I was on the outer. So there was a lot of good reason for us to develop a good friendship and an honest mateship. And he loves coming down to us because it was a an escape for him from the family clan stuff because he was never full... I don't believe he was ever fully accepted. And, you know, they would say things about Bevan. And then when I got to know Bevan, they certainly weren't true, but I think they never forgave him for getting their little girl, Kathy, pregnant when she was 16 or whenever. Um, and I think they never forgave him for that, and he was never quite in the fold, if you get what I mean. He was sort of always on the outer a little bit. He was taught the ropes by Bevan, who I think had a natural affinity for the fishing life and an ambition to do well and make money. Sometimes that was portrayed as a negative side of his personality, but I think, you know, where you sit is where you stand. His family thought of that as a positive about Bevan, that he wanted something for his children and was prepared to sort of do anything to make that happen. You mentioned money there. Just how much money is being made by these families? Do we have any handle on that? Because they're living a pretty basic existence out there, as you mentioned, on boats and in caravans. But are they making a lot of money? You know, I don't think anyone's ever gone through the books And it's been a little bit of a mystery for all of us. There's certainly a lot of money to be made. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, as one of the deckhands says, you know, you wouldn't know it. They've got no shoes. They've got no teeth. They live in these caravan encampments. But it also costs a lot of money to work and function up there. One of the things that Bevan wanted to do was get a shark reel, this sort of automated way of fishing that would have increased the amount of money that they were making. And there was a bit of push and pull between him and his wife on whether or not that was the way that she wanted to just fish for barramundi. She didn't want to be a shark fisherman. But again, his desire to be more profitable pushed him into this and he was excited about it. And it was one of the things that he was working on right before he and his son disappeared. In fact, they went to clear their shark nets on the day that they vanished. You mentioned there that you do speak to a few of Bevan's friends in this documentary, including one that was a deckhand, and you do also speak to 
a man who was a deckhand for Michael Gader, the opposing family. What did they say that their lives were like working for these families? Because from all reports and from later court case transcripts, their lives were pretty hectic working for these families. We didn't have that much contact with people who work for the current generation of the wards. As you say, there have been court cases. Everyone seems to largely get acquitted. But there's a sense of if you do the wrong thing by them, you'll be left out on the beach or in the water to figure out your own way home if you're lucky. And as people say in the film, it's an easy place to disappear. Some people go up there to purposefully, I think, disappear and escape their own lives, and others disappear against their own will. There's nothing up there. Have a look on the map. You've got Karumba and you've got Weeper and you've got Bugger all in between, a couple of um, Aboriginal establishments there. And then you go from Karumba all the way over to the NT border and you've got a couple of cattle stations. You go on the beach there by yourself, someone drops off, you're dead. That's it. You ain't getting home. You know, you've got so many rivers to cross, and if you've seen those rivers, they snake around and around and around like that. It's, you just get lost. It's, yeah, it's, it's dead man's country. And it is extremely brutal work. And I did not understand that until we began filming and you, you know, see axes being bludgeoned into these animals. I wasn't even sure, oh, fishing, it doesn't sound all that exciting necessarily. And I certainly did not, as I said, know how brutal it was going to be. Yeah, watching some of the footage of how they deal with the sea creatures is very confronting. (laughs) That does make you feel like maybe they do lose a bit of humanity in that respect. I have thoughts on, right, if you're killing things every day, even if it's fish, yes, does that take a piece of your soul? And So it's not war. Nevertheless, I think we do give something up when we have to constantly kill and constantly fight for survival. That leads us to June 5th, 2003. So Kathy and Bevan have three children by this point. The eldest is Katie, who would normally go out with her dad to clear those shark nets that you mentioned. Then there's 10-year-old Brad, who does end up going out with his dad that day. Why does Brad go instead of Katie? There is school of the air out there. That's the way that they get their education. And she had something on, the daughter. And so there's quite a bit of confusion about whether or not anyone knew that Brad was going to go out that day, or whether or not Bevan was going to be alone. As Michael Gator has said, if Bevan went missing at the shark nets, Nobody cared, nobody would notice. And I do think that had he not been with his 10 year old son, we probably wouldn't have even had an investigation. And took them kids, because he would have fought tooth and nail. And there are at least four or five witnesses that relate to us direct conversations with Michael Gator in regard to if Bevan went missing at the net, no one would ever know. So, Justine. The pair go out to the nets. How far from their encampment have they gone and what are they travelling in? They're just a few kilometres away and they're in a substantial dinghy. And the fact is that nothing was ever found. Not one bit of the dinghy, not one bit of a life jacket, not one bit of a coat, nothing. Everything disappears. And that is, as the police officer says, what was so extraordinary, you would think, something would float up to the surface, and it doesn't. So there was no evidence. You get a teaspoon of oil and pour it on water, you'll see a, a, a rainbowy shimmer for a long way. An outboard motor, well, first it's two strokes, so it's got oil in the fuel. So if it would have sunk, that fuel would have floated with a shimmer of oil. Would have been spotted by a plane, if nothing else. There was lots of things that could float out of that boat. Our specialised barrow net hooks, they usually had floats on, so if you dropped them over the side, you could lean over and grab them before a crocodile did. You know, when a boat goes down, things turn up. 
no evidence of a disappearance, no evidence of their bodies, no evidence of that dinghy, nothing. There is evidence, though, that they had made it to the shark nets, though, right? Yes, because the shark nets were half cleared. So they certainly had gone out there and they'd begun their work. And then an event occurs that stops them clearing the nets. No one knows what happened. There's only, there's only the perpetrators of this crime are the, and I say it's a crime, it, incontrovertibly it's a crime. This isn't a disappearance at sea. This isn't an accident. There's third party involvement of some nature in this. That's former detective Senior Sergeant N. Kinbacker from Queensland Police, who was brought in to lead the investigation into Brad and Bevan's disappearance in 2003. So from that point on, Kathy, his wife, has gone to clear other nets in another yes. direction with their youngest child. So she comes back. Bevan's not back again. What does she do from this point? She calls her mother and... She also gets in contact with Michael Gator and they begin searching and the community hears of the disappearance and eventually one of the largest land and sea rescue operations in all of Queensland history begins. Dozens of airplanes, boats, everyone's out there sort of forming a grid pattern looking for them. And this goes on for several days and about four days in the police come up because it seems like it's not kosher, as it were. What led police to start thinking that it was more than just a pair missing at sea? Well, I think they say they will never really know, but they come up just to find out, is this more than a disappearance? And they hear rumours of an affair between Kathy and Michael Gator. It doesn't really touch the sides at first. Kathy denies it to the police for some time. And I think that the denial itself is suspicious because why would you pretend something isn't happening that everyone in the community knows is going on? And they bring in Michael Gator for questioning. And as they say, but for his mother, they probably wouldn't have laid a glove on him. It's that Michael Gator and his mother were in a boat together near that area, and she can't keep her story together. And that's when everything begins to crumble. And that's when they think something's really gone on. So his mother is Joan Gator. Joan Ma Gator. Joan Ma Gator, that paints a picture. (laughs) What is she saying that has police thinking that she's not keeping her story straight? Well, they've got all kinds of rumours about coming down on one boat and why they've got to swap boats and... Guns go missing. They can't find a single gun that the Gators own. She says that they've gotten rid of them because Michael Gator was threatening to commit suicide. The youngest son, whom for many years no one knew existed, Vince Jr., basically says none of that's true. And so once this is refuted by her child, they say that's it. Game's on. It's a sordid tale involving two fishing families from the far, far north. Father and son, Bevan and Brad Simmons, missing, presumed murdered by Joan Gator and her son, Michael. You said that they had a theory about having to switch boats. Mm. And the boat that they were in initially has disappeared. Yes, entirely gone. They find it later secreted and sunk down the river. But again, it doesn't tie them directly to the crime the police reenact what they think must have happened. And the timelines of these two boats they've got, one being driven by the younger son and the other by Ma and Michael Gator, it just shouldn't take that long for those two boats to come together. And there's another little bit of it where they say, oh, they were racing back because the younger son didn't have his fishing license with him and he could get in trouble. And everyone says, well, That's a bunch of nonsense. One thing that was quite striking in the Cape is a conversation that one of Bevan Simmons' friends said he had with Joan Gator, Mm. where she reportedly tells him she knows how to dispose of bodies. Yeah, she says that one of her relatives, 
who had been in Papua New Guinea had learned how to get rid of bodies in ways that would never be found. And, you know, in essence, you tie everybody up in a net and sink them into a crock hole and everything will eat them up and there'll be no evidence of anyone ever existing. For whatever reason, Joan Gator came into our camp. She wanted to see if I had some refrigerant gas. We did the normal neighbourly thing. Would you like a cup of coffee and a biscuit? We're sitting at the table having a cup of coffee and a biscuit. And somehow, for some reason, she brought this conversation up saying how she knew things about the bush and that her uncle or something like that, I'm pretty sure it was her uncle, was in special forces up in New Guinea and had taught her if you wanted to get rid of a body, how to do it, you wrapped them up tightly in trawler net and weighted them down. So if you sunk them down to the bottom, they would sink in the mud, the bones, nothing would ever float to the surface. And in these northern waters, all the plankton and everything would eat everything away and nothing would ever be found. And I'm sitting there going, well, that's weird. Why would you want to sell me that? And that made me very much on guard. And Joan would have had a particular interest in the continuation of Kathy and Michael's relationship, wouldn't she? He'd never really had any girlfriends prior to that, right? Yeah, well, this was the fascinating bit that the lead investigator in this discusses the fact that because Michael Gator was living in this very isolated community, and in fact, as a child, only really played with the wards, the ward children. He comes to know the pleasures of women far later in life. And he does go off the reservation, as it were, off the fishing camp, seeking out girlfriends. And for his mother, this is sort of a disaster because she's got this enfeebled aging husband. The younger son is too young to probably really help with fishing at that point. And so she's lost her main source of financial support in Michael Gator. So I think for her, had he come back and been involved with Kathy and that all worked out, that would have been all the better for her as well and for their family. But yes, he does. He he comes to meet women, I think, well into his 20s, really. And I suspect, you know, look, maybe there's an old infatuation, you know, someone you've met as a child that you still fancy. And certainly I think up there, Kathy, you know, was a glamour. And there's not a lot of women up there. So after all of these conversations, police have got their suspicions. Do we know what finally led to them pressing charges against Michael and Joan Gator? Well, we know that there was nobody else in the vicinity except for those two. And as the police say, at some point you just have to act. You hope someone will maybe fess up. And at some point, you know, it's time to act. And so they did. They had a star chamber, which is a very particular thing to, I believe, Queensland, where you bring in your suspects. And you say to them, you can't lie to us. We'll arrest you for anything you lie about. But we can't use anything you tell us against you in a court of law. So they did that star chamber and immediately after the arrests occurred. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Claire Murphy. I'm speaking with Justine Rosenthal about the disappearance of Bevan and Brad Simmons in Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria in 2003. So they've got nothing but circumstantial evidence at this point, because as you mentioned, not a single skerrick of Bevan or Brad or the boat has been found at all. Even to this day, there is not a single piece of evidence of their whereabouts found. So they go to court and they've charged Michael and Joan or Margator. How does that court case play out? Well, there were lots of theories presented that other people from 
other regions could have come zooming down and somehow caught them unawares or that Brad and Bevan went off on the lamb. I don't think anyone truly believed those, but I guess there was enough benefit of the doubt. And there were many people who were frightened to speak for reprisal, I think perhaps by either family. Both Ma and Michael Gator are acquitted. The case remains open 20 years later. And in Queensland, there is no double jeopardy. Not to say that it's necessarily Ma and Michael, but if there's any fresh evidence found, people can be retried or new people can be brought to trial and charged. But, you know, again, it was a totally circumstantial case with no evidence and no witnesses. When you say people were afraid to speak for fear of reprisal, what were they afraid would happen to them if they spoke out? Well, people go missing up in the Cape. And I think you are dealing with at least one family that we know is dangerous. I mean, the Gators have a reputation for that. They've been charged multiple times. And there is no law and order. And even the MP there, Bob Catter, says that. The Gulf country is a different world, a completely different world. It's a cliche, I know, but up there, men can be men. You're right out, you go at the back of the pub. Why don't I go further than that? You know, might end up in a shootout. And this leads to people killing each other, which is not an uncommon event. And as the one of the rescue workers says, again, everyone up there has got guns. So, you know, what do you do when you are pushed to the extremes of your humanity? What are you capable of? And especially if you are not a part of that community, that fishing community. So there's a lot of theories that maybe the motivation for the death or disappearance of at least Bevan Simmons and maybe accidentally Brad at the same time was the love triangle that you mentioned, that there was a romance at some stage going on between Kathy and Michael and she claims it had only been a few days but others in the community say that that is a lie and that it had been going on for quite some time. Was there evidence that that continued on after Bevan's disappearance? Was that looking more likely? Did their relationship continue? One wonders, had the 10-year-old boy not been there, what would have happened? As I said to you, I'm not even sure there would have been a police investigation since disappearing up there is so normal. Kathy and Michael Gator did not rekindle their relationship. Maybe in the days shortly after, it may have continued. But the clans did not join up, as may have been the motivation. Getting rid of Bevan would have made a union between Kathy and Michael Gator much more likely. She certainly didn't want to lose her children, I don't think, and there were a lot of money at stake. If it was so well known that Kathy and Michael were having an affair, had there been any negative interactions between Bevan and Michael before his disappearance? Yes. They had had a physical dispute, in fact, in Karamba in the days leading up to the disappearance. And I think that certainly according to Bevan's family, he was well aware of the affair. Everybody was aware of the affair. And in part, it was the police's knowledge of this physical dispute that led to more suspicion about who might have been the culprit. This is Kathy's recollection of the altercation between her husband and Michael at Karamba. I don't know what how they got into the blue, but I think Michael had Bevan down on the ground with his leg on his neck or something, yeah. Um, and then we... We left Bevan there because he was really drunk and we went out because we had a place in Karamba, so we went and stayed there for the night, the kids and I and, and Michael. It's such a small community and everyone knows everybody's business. Did you get the feeling that in interviewing people close to this disappearance, that people kind of know what happened but they can't really say anything or they just can't prove it? Maybe a combination of all of the above. As you said, one of Bevan's close friends, I mean, this is a question part of guilt and complicity. And 
how that ripples through a community and people wondering if they had said something, spoken up earlier, could this have been avoided? I think there is a sense amongst everyone that the little boy was never intended to be a victim. And that that may be where the real sense of guilt lies with everyone. We've got an allegedly dangerous person involved with another family, and he has expressed his desire to be with his lover. And how does he make that happen? And again, that he has threatened it, spoken it aloud, everyone's heard it, and no one has said anything. Peter Graham from Marine Rescue Queensland, who was part of the search for Bevan and Brad in 2003, put forward this hypothesis in Justine's documentary, The Cape. The only scenario I can come up with, if they've both been shot, if that be the case, I can only think that for some reason the shooter never saw the kid until after Dad had been shot and then the kid's heads popped up. So this year marks 20 years since Bevan and Brad went missing on that day. Will it take someone to confess to the crime for that to be solved? Is there any other way that they could ever figure out what happened to those two? I suspect, yes, someone would have to confess. And the question of how much that guilt is a burden and what incentives the police or the government would be willing to give in order for someone to say, yes, I did it. And in fact, look, we don't know who did it. We have to say the two who were on trial were acquitted and we will never know sort of if gunshots were fired, who fired them? And does someone have that burden on their soul but not want to deal with the consequences of a confession? Not everything makes it into the film, of course. My sense from listening to the interviews is that there are people who would want to put an end to this. How was this disappearance covered across Australia? It's in such a remote place, such a small community, two people going missing at sea. Does it make national headlines? I mean, other than Queensland newspapers, does it, does it go across the country? I think it did briefly. We used some of that news footage. There was such a salacious nature to it that that was all that really got covered was this love triangle aspect. And our hope was in doing this film, I don't think we ever believed we were going to have a I gotcha moment. All of a sudden someone's going to talk and we're going to hear something we've never heard before. There were bits and pieces that we've passed on to the police because stories weren't matching up or things like that. But we always hope to be making, in some sense, an elegy to Bevan and Brad Simmons because they were, within all of this news coverage, both in print and in the media, really forgotten. And as their family say, forgotten within the trial and forgotten afterwards. it, It was all about the wards and the gators and never really about the Simmons family. I couldn't even go the last day of the trial because I knew that they were going to get off and I couldn't bear to be there. I knew they were going to walk free and they did. They walked out of the courtroom free, people. But I still remember the look on Michael's face when when the verdict was read and he turned around and he just had this shock look on his face like, That was it, as he turned around and then he faced back. And that was pretty much it. I remember being so angry. And, you know, they sort of come over to interview us, but they were just, they were just so hell bent on Michael's story. You know, Michael and Joan, you know, they've just been acquitted of murder and I just think Bevan and Brad were kind of really forgotten in that moment. 
I guess that we'll take that to my grave. Thanks to Justine for helping us to tell this story. Her documentary, The Cape, is available to stream now exclusively on Stan. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Claire Murphy. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan, with assistant production by Tali Blackman. Our audio design is by Scott Stronick. If you've enjoyed our Behind the Scenes of Crime special, let us know by leaving a review in your favourite podcast app or send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.